Riven stood in the uppermost room of the central tower of his citadel, a fortress of shadows and dark stone carved in relief into the sheer face of a jagged peak. The starless black vault of the plain sky hung over a landscape of gray and black, where live the dark simulacra of actual things. Shadows and wraiths and specters and ghosts and other undead hung in the air around the citadel, or prowled the foothills and plains near it, so numerous their glowing eyes looked like swarms of fireflies. He felt the darkness in everything he could see, felt it as an extension of himself, and the feeling made him too big by half. If there were another plane of existence outside of the material plane in the Nine Hells in Baldur's Gate 3 that we were actually able to visit and experience, I'd have to guess that this would be the Shadowfell plane. Not only is the Shadowfell referenced quite a lot in Baldur's Gate 3's early access, but we also get to see the Shadowfell in the intro cinematic to the game, and this was confirmed to be the Shadowfell by the lead writer at Larian Studios, Adam Smith. So without further ado, sit back, relax, and let's venture deep into this plane of despair and gloom. As mentioned in one of my previous lore videos, and I do recommend watching those videos in order, the Shadowfell is a reflection or an echo of the Material Plane. It overlaps the Material Plane, and because of this, landmarks from the Material Plane can be recognized here, but they do appear as twisted and warped reflections. In the intro cinematic to BG-3, you can see these dark, jagged rocks that the Nautiloid ship and the Githyanki Dragon Riders are navigating through, and these jagged, dark cliffs could very well be a beautiful mountain pass back on the Material Plane. The City of Neverwinter's dark reflection on the Shadowfell Plane is called the City of Evernight, and as you can see, Evernight doesn't exactly appear to be the Jewel of the North like Neverwinter is oftentimes referred to as. The Shadowfell is a place that hates the light, where the sky is a black vault with neither sun nor stars. It's a dimension of black, gray, and white where most other color has been leached from everything. If we were to enter the Shadowfell Plane by foot, this would likely be achieved by passing through a Shadow Crossing, which are locations where the Material Plane and the Shadowfell are so thin that creatures can walk from one plane to the other. These Shadow Crossings tend to form in gloomy dark places where spirits or the stench of death lingers, such as open graves and tombs and even battlefields of the past. The Shadowfell is filled with so much fear and dread, gloom and despair that in 5th edition D&D, there's actually a Shadowfell Despair chart which guides dungeon masters on the effects that the Shadowfell's melancholic atmosphere can have on players that are brave enough, or should I say unfortunate enough, to find themselves there. The longer a player stays in the Shadowfell, the more likely they are to suffer from apathy, dread, and even madness. Even the famous Archmage Mordenkainen, who traveled to the Shadowfell in an attempt to free a local population from a vampire lord, ended up going mad here, but he was ultimately helped by Elminster and Storm Silverhand, and his mind was nursed back to some resemblance of sanity. Now let's get into a brief history of the Shadowfell. In 1385 DR, Shar, the Lady of Loss, the goddess of darkness and night, engineered the murder of the mother of magic, Mistra, by Siric. The murder of Mistra caused the weave of magic to collapse, and this would plunge the multiverse into chaos. This cataclysmic event is known as the Spell Plague, and it lasted for almost a century, but more on that in a future video. Before the collapse of the weave of magic occurred though, Shar had the opportunity to manipulate some of the necrotic energies from the negative energy plane into what was called at the time the Plane of Shadow. Shar called her new creation the Shadowfell. The power of this combination actually caused the souls of the dead to be drawn through the Shadowfell before they were able to reach their place of final judgment on the Fugue Plane. This is no longer the case in modern-day Forgotten Realms. The Shadowfell became a place from which necrotic energies and shadow magic stemmed from, and although Shar does not currently reside in the Shadowfell as she moved her Tower of Loss to the Astral Sea, she still of course has very strong ties to it. Having shadow magic take over the Weave of Magic is one of Shar's ultimate goals, if not her ultimate goal, and the Shadowfell is where this type of dark magic is channeled from. 
Now let's get into some of the different creatures, locations, and powerful beings that call this plane their home. The Shadowfell is filled with all sorts of creatures of shadow and undead, such as vampires, liches, shadow dragons, and even ghosts and specters that you may find in the ethereal plane. One of the most dominant humanoid races that can be found here are called Shades, which tend to be the ancestors of Netherese humans that are said to have traded away their very souls in exchange for profound physical prowess, protection from harm, and ageless immortality. If you come across a Shadow Var, either in the Shadowfell or more commonly on the Material Plane, these are mortal inhabitants of a city that was recently destroyed known as Taltantar. Taltantar was actually transported to the Shadowfell Plane for a prolonged period of time before it was transported back to the Material Plane and ultimately destroyed but many of its citizens are still very much alive. With this exposure to the Shadowfell and its atmosphere, many of the effects began to show on Taltantar citizens, and these folks became known as the Shadowvar. The Shadar Kai race, on the other hand, are humanoids that are native to the Shadowfell itself, and an easy way to describe a Shadar Kai is by thinking of a Shadow Elf. Since I just mentioned the Shadar Kai, this is a great time to bring up their goddess, who is known as the Raven Queen. The Raven Queen is a being of dark mystery, who rules from her raven throne within a castle deep within the Shadowfell known as the Fortress of Memories. From her throne, she sends out her ravens in Shadar Kai to find interesting souls that she can pluck from various planes of existence and bring them back to the Shadowfell. It is said that she will then watch these souls as they attempt to unravel the mystery of their being and slowly descend into madness. The Raven Queen appears to be focused on collecting memories and strong emotions that are associated with loss and tragedy, but overall she still remains a great mystery even to those of great knowledge. Now let's talk a bit about the Domains of Dread which are located in the remote corners of the Shadowfell. The Domains of Dread are ruled over by accursed beings of terrible evil, with the most notable being that of Count Strahd von Zarevich, the Dark Lord Vampire of Barovia. The Valley of Barovia was originally a location on the Material Plane, but it was transported to the Shadowfell by mists controlled by evil entities known as the Dark Powers. The Dark Powers were an unknown mystical force that had the ability to pull complete regions into the Shadowfell. Now the Valley of Barovia is overlooked by the towering spires of Castle Ravenloft, which is where the feared tyrant Count Strahd rules from. But it's important to note that Count Strahd is also held prisoner within this domain due to a pact that he forged with the Dark Powers in order to achieve immortality. Most citizens of Barovia resided in the village of Barovia, and most of them were unaware that Strahd was a vampire. Now what makes Barovia interesting in relation to BG3? is that the description of Barovia's terrain in the picture displayed in the Dungeon Master's guidebook look eerily similar to what we see in the intro cinematic to Baldur's Gate 3. Densely forested areas, jagged dark rocks that make up terrain that is not easily traversable, winters that are long and bitter, sheer cliffs and outcroppings, and a sky permanently overcast with storm clouds. Could this just be a coincidence? Well, it certainly could be, but... I don't know, I'd say this is definitely worthy of being food for thought. Volothomp Gadarm, a character in Baldur's Gate 3 and the original Baldur's Gate games, also visited Barovia with the objective of mapping it. Volo made acquaintances with a few vampire hunters and was even intercepted by Strahd himself. But with the help of a special charm given to him by the famed wizard Elminster, he was able to escape and return to Faerun. Another notable location in the Shadowfell is the very large Gothic Victorian city of Gloomrot, home to many Shades, Shadowvar, and Shadar Kai. Dristo Erden and a few other notable Forgotten Realms characters were actually held prisoner in Gloomrot for a period of time, and even though at this point it is part of Forgotten Realms history. I know some of you are reading the Drist book, so I'll leave it at that. And for the last part of this video, I wanted to bring up a potential spoiler. Although this is information that is already publicly out, and it's part of a book published by Wizards of the Coast, but not written by Wizards, and it's called Minsk and Boo's Journal of Villainy. Whether this is canon or not, though, is still unclear, and even though it was published by Wizards, many consider it bad fanfiction. 
And the reason why I'm labeling this particular piece of information as a spoiler is because if it turns out to be true, it could ruin a potential surprise that you may find if we do end up visiting the Shadowfell in BG3. So if you don't want to risk it, have a wonderful day and I'll catch you on next Sunday's lore video. So in Minsk and Boo's Journal of Villainy, John Irenicus, the main antagonist of BG2, and Bodhi, his vampire sister, are said to currently reside on the Shadowfell plane due to a pact with the dark powers of the Shadowfell. John and Bodhi are said to have been drawn into a dark reflection of the treetop city, which is of course a reference to Saldan Esselar in the Nation of Tethyr. And this dark reflection is located in the Domain of Dread. John also appears as a Lich of Shadowfell in this book. I do want to reiterate, we do not know if this is fact or if it's canon, so it may not turn out to be true, but it's definitely something to consider, especially taking into account that this book was published by Wizards of the Coast. And that'll be it for this Sunday's lore video. Who knows, in Baldur's Gate 3, we might find ourselves walking through a shadow crossing and ending up in the plane of despair and gloom. Definitely not out of the realm of possibilities. Thank you so much to all channel members and patrons for helping keep this series alive, and I'll catch you guys on the next one.